before him with truth. He knows our hearts. He knows every thought. He knows every difficult. He knows it all. We can't fool him. We just need to come before him in honesty and truth. Every doubt, every fear, he knows. Oh, Lord, just dispel all the doubts, all the fears, oh, God. For Lord, love casts out all fear. And you are love. So love, come this morning. Oh, come and overpower every darkness, everything that would hinder. And let your love flow. Let your love flow for you are love, you are love, you are love, you are love. I praise you. Oh, who reigns forevermore? Who reigns so excited for what he has in store today and these coming days the fire that he started in these weeks will burn will burn bigger and brighter until we're fully consumed and I believe that with all my heart amen and uh, in this week God reminded me why uh, why I start service and why I'm up here he's called me to give him worthy and praise him with all that I have and sometimes I come up here and I don't give him my all and I want to do that and God has shown us and shown this church that obedience is the key obedience is the key to open the heavens to invite his presence so I beg you to obey if he's calling you please obey if he's telling you to come up and start dancing, obey. If he's calling you to shout, obey. There's nothing to be scared of. Obey.
Innermost, Como dice la palabra, like the word says, correrán ríos de agua viva. Rivers of living waters. Ven a mí, come to me. Ven a mí, come to me. No dice ven y piensa. It doesn't say come and think. Dice ven a mí. It says come to me. Y bebe. And drink. Simple. Simple. Be, bebe. Drink. No pienses. Don't think. No estés Diciendo, ¿será o no será? Don't say it be, it might be, it might not. Simple, simple. Ven, come, bebe, drink, bebe, come and drink. No pienses. Don't think. Porque si bebes, because if you drink, porque si mejoras, because if you drink, si, more. si mejoras de beber, mejorarás como pensás. Because your thinking will change, it will improve. Ven y bebe, come and drink. Ven y bebe, come and drink. Y deja. And leap. Que los ríos that those rivers de tu from the, your innermost from inside will flow ríos de sanidad. rivers of healing ríos de salvación. rivers of salvation ríos de revelación. rivers of revelation ríos que rivers dan vida. Will, that will give you life y decir, Señor, acá estoy. and say Lord I'm here Quiero beber de tu presencia, I want to drink from your presence ¿Qué es lo que satisface? Lo único que satisface, the only Señor. thing that satisfies me acá Lord estoy. Señor, tú dices el que tiene sed. You say whoever has eats thirst. No, el que se conforma por su estado actual. No, the one conforms on their own state. Pero el que tiene sed. But the one that's thirsty. El que sabe que hay algo más. The, the one that knows that there's more. Que hay algo más para él. That there's more of him. De parte de Dios. From God. Y él te está diciendo hoy. And he's telling you today. No Estela. No Estela. No Sharon. No Sharon. Ven y bebe. Come and drink. Simple. Simple. Bebe de esas aguas de su presencia. Come drink from those waters of his presence. Que cambia, que transforma. The transforms the pills. Hallelujah. 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 share a word with you today. We start a little bit late, but we've got all day. And uh, last Friday I went to Hebron to work with my son and came back late. It was very dark outside. And on the way back I stopped at a service station. <coughs> It was full of cars filling up with gas and uh, I just watched a couple of days before a short documentary on cars and supercars and horsepower and nitro, how to get more horsepower out of the car and uh, I was watching all these different cars in there, it looked like a corral full of horses as each car had an engine that's defined by how many horses it has inside the engine, horsepower. Small ones have about 70 horsepower, others average about 120, and some SUVs with turbo or cars have 200 plus horsepower. But to my surprise, totally, totally to my surprise, I just finished filling up the tank was ready to get in and I looked 
and I saw a one horsepower vehicle leaving the gas station. Now, I've been to Thailand, gone in tuk-tuks with my wife. There's about 10 horsepower. We also took a rickshaw in Malaysia back from the, the uh, stalls, stores, to the hotel. That was a one-man power rickshaw. But what I saw was a horse with a rider coming out of a gas station. Now, if it would have been a hundred years before, it would have been a common sight to have horses in stables because a hundred years before, everything was horsepower. Horses took people here and there. Carriages took people here and there. And this is just so highly unusual that I paid attention to the rider, the saddle. I said, what on earth? And as always, when I see things that call my attention, I know there's something God wants to speak through this. You can't buy that vehicle in a car dealership. Can't be made in a factory, nor an assembly line, nor built by a robot. That's a special vehicle for special people who love horses. Some states, like Wyoming and others, have wild horses roaming across the pastures and the fields. They go far to graze in fine grass. Many are sick horses, caked with mud, their mane and tail ugly, gnarled, mangled by brambles, thistles, thorns, flea-bitten, full of insects. And then there are special horses, show horses, healthy horses, that had someone feed them, take care of them, protect them, give them special meals, special blends of grain, minerals, vitamins, medicines, washed and brushed. They're the pride of their owners and protectors. There's people that spend a lot of money just to have a horse, take care of it, ride it. Some horses get to fly on airplanes with first class service, with attendants, taking care of them, taking them all over the world to shows in Saudi Arabia and other places where they can meet other special horses. You've probably seen cowboy movies, old cowboy movies. It shows the Indians riding their horses bareback. No reins, no rope across the neck. Bareback, no saddle. Or maybe you've seen a rodeo. Riding a special horse, roping horse. That seems to know what to do. The rider just grabs his lasso and shoots the lasso and when the steer is lassoed, the horse immediately comes to a sliding stop and starts backing up all by itself. What makes him that special? What makes him different than a wild stallion running free in the plains of Wyoming? Free in the world. The difference is that he was chosen, first of all, by a man that would become his master. And he learned obedience. That's the difference between a wild horse and a show horse. An obedient horse. A horse that has learned to use all his senses like the Indian horse to feel with such sensitivity what the rider wants him to do. That horse, like the rodeo horse, we don't see anything 
But he feels the knee on one side, the knee on the other, the slight pressure. He's sensitive, awaiting the slightest instruction. Movement like a whisper. Like it says in Isaiah 30, 21, Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Turn to the right hand. When you turn to the left hand, Those horses have learned to be so sensitive. Recognizes many control signals that are, that are just a slight pressure on the left, on the right. Sometimes the rider just leans a little bit and the horse senses that his master is leaning, just leaning slightly. No one else can tell, but he tells the weight distribution changed a little bit. And a well-schooled horse needs little pressure. Almost no pressure on the bit. The reins don't even need to be used, except in emergencies. God has many kinds of horses. Not only obedient ones, good ones. But also, in his herd, there's rebellious horses. In fact, God speaks about those horses. In Psalm 32, verse 9, he says, They're without understanding. They must be forced to obey. No good as a show horse. No good as a jumping horse. No good as a barrel race horse. No good as a riding horse. No good for anything except, well, it's prohibited here in the States, but not in Italy and other countries, for horse meat. Yes, he says they don't have understanding. Psalm 32, 9 says, Don't be like the horse or the mule that have no understanding, whose mouth must be held in with a bit and a bridle. That they come, lest they come near to you. Horses, horses, by their nature, they fear the sons of the Creator. They fear man. Their instinct, like many wild people horses, is to run from anything that comes from God. Run until they get tired of running. And if the man creature rides after him, runs after him, he'll get tired and look and say, What do you want? Leave me alone. Trots away or walks away. But he doesn't want to come to man. Like the saying says, You can run. But if God wants you, you can't hide. He'll chase you till you're tired like that old booklet that said the bloodhound of heaven. Speaking about the Psalm 139.7 where it says, where shall I flee from your presence? Where can I go? Go to the ocean, you're there. Go to the depths, you're there. Go to hell itself and you're there. Stop chasing me, leave me alone. Yes, there's so many rebellious horses. They don't want to come. They know they belong, but they want to be wild. They want to be free. They want to do what they want to do, even if it kills them, and many times it does. The wolves get them. And as they're dying, they say, oh, what a stupid horse I was. I should have surrendered. I should have given up. 30 years ago, I read a book. It was about a story. About a horse, a wild horse who used to roam free. Didn't know what color it was because he would roll in a mud hole every day to try to get rid of the itching of the bites of the horse flies. Then one day, 
he saw far off some horses with something strange behind them, following them. And so in his curiosity, he went to a little hill and looked. And behold, what he saw was horses and a carriage led by six beautiful white horses and another horse running alongside them tied with a rope. Those horses were white, shiny, bristling in the sun, adorned with gold chains and colorful headdresses of feathers because they were pulling the carriage of the prince, the king's son. They were so strong, so healthy, so well fed, so fearless, so happy, so proud they seemed. They had a purpose in life as they journeyed back and forth taking the prince. And he looked at those beautiful horses. He was free, but he was hungry. And he was nothing like those horses. And so, every day he came and watched as a carriage went by. And one day he decided to follow them to see where they went. So from afar he followed and saw that the destination was a castle with a stone-walled fence around it, huge. And that was their home. They were safe from the attack of wolves, of coyotes, of wild dogs. And he watched from up the hill how inside there was such beautiful grassland, peaceful. There were horses, yes, many white horses. There were different fields separated by another stone fence. He didn't understand why. Big horses, small horses, colts, mothers with colts. Then one day he saw a man walk out of the castle. He didn't know, but it was the prince. And he called out. And some of the horses that weren't behind a fence, but inside the walls, they came running when they heard him call. And then he saw those horses begin to eat something that the man put into a wooden tub. He began to see that they were eating something that seemed to be so nice. They whined. They were happy. And he began to desire that food and and the life of the white horses. Even though he was not white, he was dark brown, caked with all that mud Little by little, the days went by, got closer and sniffed and got closer and sniffed. And then one day when the man was back in the castle, no one was watching. He went in through the gate and licked a little bit of the powder that was left in that wooden tub. The remains of whatever that man had put in there. Oh, it was so lovely. And little by little, he began to lose the fear of the king's son because he saw the other horses didn't seem to feed him, to fear him. They just stood there and the man touched them and brushed them. They seemed to not mind at all. Because you know by nature the horses are, are fearful, totally fearful. They panic. Horses, even though they're big and strong, they get panically so quickly especially when they're confronted with surprise or something different. A tiny mouse can make a horse bolt. Sudden noise, sudden movement. A little snake crosses path, can cause him to, cause him to startle and run away like a coward, even though he could just stomp on that thing, and that's it. And just to see... Other horses panic and begin to run. They begin to run for no reason at all. Because by instinct, they follow the crowd. If everyone's 
afraid, I'll be afraid too. I don't know what happened, what they're afraid of, but they're running, I'll run too. Their instinct, their first reaction is to do what others do. Even though there's no danger, he'll follow the crowd. Because only years of trusting the master slowly as they learn that he wants no harm of them, do they begin to surrender and even obey the one who calls them. And back to our story one day after the horses were gone, the king's son, having seen this horse, wild horse, dirty horse, after he tied the other horses to the carriage and was about to leave, he, he left a little extra food inside that tub. And he went in, and oh, how beautiful that food was. The next day, he came and expected to look to see if, yes, he left another morsel. So when he left, in he went again. But each time, each day, he got a little closer, wanted to be a little closer to the food until he went inside the walls and, and got closer. And, until finally he just stood there waiting, okay, come on, give me some food. Don't touch me. I'm not yours, but give me some food. Little by little, he just stood there until the man came out, gave him some food, and left. And one day, as the man was pouring out the food and he was about to eat, the man just touched him and he shivered. Just a little touch it was, a light touch, but he shook with fear. But the food was so good, it didn't hurt, but it was different. Yes, many times the horses, especially if they're not used to it, if you touch them, they'll just shiver like that. I know I've had horses. I've broken in horses. I know what you do. And how they shiver. And that's the first step. The first step to making it yours. It's just a touch and let go. He'll shiver. And then another little touch. The next day a little more. Until he learns, oh, the touch is nice. There's no harm. And soon that horse lost his fear and allowed the man to touch him. Oh, how nice that touch was. And one day the man brought a little bit of water. He knew what water was. He had been in the water before. So he didn't find that strange. He began to wash. To wash him from top to bottom. And to his surprise, he found out that underneath the coat of mud... He was a white horse too. And then the man did many things. And then he brought some oil and put it across his coat until it shined like the horses on the carriage. And then he noticed that the flies didn't come. The flies didn't bite. He was free. And he was allowed to stay within the walls, inside the castle. To be with the other happy horses. There he felt safe. But sometimes he would miss his friends outside and the world outside. And he said, I'll go, go see what it's like. And sometimes he would leave and not come back for days. Yes, he went back to the old mud hole and rolled and rolled and rolled. Because the flies attacked him again. And he could hear, one day he heard the call. Oh, oh, yeah, I know, that man's calling me. But he didn't go back until one day the herd was attacked by wild dogs. And they caught him and bit him. And he turned, he began to run towards a castle where he knew he would be protected. In panic, in fear and hurt, he went back. And the king's son brought healing ointment, ointments until after some days and weeks, he was healthy again. He had a few scars, but he was healthy again. 
Then the king did so, the king's son did something. He grabbed a piece of leather and tied it around his front feet. He could jump, he could, but he couldn't run. He was hobbled. Strange thing, he didn't like it. But he could still move around in the castle and still, but, but he couldn't go far away. But he didn't even want to go far away because the food was nice, oil was nice. And then one day he allowed the halter to be placed around his neck. Yes, he saw that the horses that took the chariot, they had halters too. He didn't know what that was, so he says, well, I want to be like the king's horses, so he let them put on the halter. And then he took the hobble off his front legs, but then he tied a rope to that halter. It's that thing that goes around the neck and the head, and you tie a rope to it. You know, horses are so scared, scared of being touched. They need to get used to your hands. They they need to get used to the halter. The halter is like a bridle, but it doesn't have a bit. So you can use it to tie a horse, to catch them from the field, to lead them. You can do everything except ride them. That introduces them to the bridle, the reins, and the bit which goes in the mouth and is used for riding. The bit the bridle that goes over his head functions together to help the rider control the horse so it goes where he wants it to go. That bit is a little piece of metal that when they pull the reins, the piece of metal hits against the top, the roof of his mouth where there's no teeth and it hurts, applies pressure causes pain if necessary because sometimes if the horse gets mad or gets scared or starts running and running towards the cliff it's the only thing that can stop him a heavy pull of the reins so he doesn't hurt himself the pain that is caused by the owner knowing that he will cause pain he knows is smaller than the pain that will happen if he falls over the cliff But the horse doesn't understand it. We don't understand either, do we? When things in life cause pain or happen to us, why is this happening to us? How come he's supposed to be good and suddenly he's doing me harm, but he doesn't understand? When you have to pull the bit, it's because you won't respond to the knees. You won't respond to the whisper. You won't respond to the voice. You won't respond to the, whoa, stop. The only recourse of the owner is to cause pain. So there's not more pain of destruction. So you never want to tie a horse from the bridle because if he tries to get away from a fire or whatever, he'll hurt himself badly and damage their mouth. That's what the halter is for. The halter is tied in a way that if the horse panics, if he really wants to get away, he can. It will break the halter And he won't be able to escape from the fire, whatever. If he wants to go, he can go. The halter doesn't mean you're a prisoner. It just means it's a reminder. Stay here. Here you'll be safe. Here you'll have food. Here you'll have medicine. You can't run with the the way that your foot is hurt. You have to stay here until it gets healed. It's called a breakaway halter. God, the horse whisperer. Yes, he can force us if he wants to. He can kill us if he wants to. He can make us surrender. 
I know how to make a horse surrender. You tie him to a stake. You leave him there for two weeks, no food, no water. And when he was almost dying, you come and give him a little bit of water. You need me. You're mine. If I don't give you water, you die. And he, little by little, he gets the idea. This guy's my owner. Oh, yes. By fear. You can instill fear. You can whip him into submission. Until that spirited horse is not spirited anymore. He's lost his spirit. He's broken. That's why you call it breaking a horse. But it's not the best way. God doesn't want broken horses. Yes, he'll obey you by fear of that whip again. But God doesn't want servants. He wants friends. He wants us to learn to obey. For our own good, God is the horse whisperer. A whisperer means a person that excels in calming and training a usually hard to manage animals using non coercive methods based on the understanding of the animal's natural instincts. A horse whisperer. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He can make us want to be broken. He can make us want to obey because God is the alter, ultimate horse whisperer. His ultimate goal is not control, it's obedience. Obedience by trust, not by fear. It's not that fear that it says in Proverbs is the wisdom, the fear of God beginning of wisdom. It's another type of wisdom, respect of authority. Not forcing that surrender. Not whipping them to submission. God's ultimate goal is obedience. To follow his directions without the need of force. To follow their master, out of respect to have true happiness in life. The horse will always be free. Free to leave the master. The relationship will not be one of force, but one of trust and of obedience. And one day, back to our story, I read, he was allowed... He was allowed to be tied with that halter to the carriage one day. And he remembered seeing another horse tied there. He wasn't part of the six. Didn't have the beautiful plumes and golden chains. But he was able to trot by them and go to new places. To be tied to the side of the carriage and the other six horses and learn to go in and to go out and not to get in the way. And how to go straight, not to pull in the wrong direction. How to see what the horses, other horses do. And when he heard the commands, the whispers, and see the ears perk up of the lead white horse, and he turned to the left, he said, oh, oh that's what the whisper means. And so he learned, little by little, tied to those other older horses. Learned to come in. To stay out of the way. To don't pull the wrong way. And little by little. As the prince spoke to him in soft words. He began to trust and obey. And to let him put things on him. Small things in the beginning. Small burdens. But he wasn't used to, to carrying burdens of course. First of all just a little blanket. Said, oh, I don't like this. But oh, I guess I can put up with this. Then a little bit more, a little bit more, until he finally was able to get the harness on him. And slowly he learned to come every time he was called. Because every time he come, he would be happy he had come. And when he called, he would be fed and touched and brushed and made to feel so good and washed. Until finally obedience 
and not fear made him one of the king's horses. And as he saw, there were other white horses too, but they were behind a fence. They were not called by the prince. They were protected, of course, because they were in the wall. Some of them were, were descendants from the great stud chariot horse was their grandfather. But they were in that secluded field, safe, close to the castle, but not close to the master. Because like some horses, they call them Spanish mañosos. They get bad habits. They develop bad habits. They want to do what they want to do. They don't come when they're called. They want to come when I'm hungry. They don't accept the halter. I'm free. It's almost like they think that, that the king is privileged to have me in his castle farm. <laughs> Stupid as that sounds. They don't understand. They're silly horses. They think they're special. And yes, they're special because they're descendants of somebody that was special. They don't accept the halter. They don't accept to have to come or heed the reins, nor turn, nor stop when they hear the word, whoa! Even loudly, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa! I like this. I'm going to keep running, running, running. No, sorry. If you don't learn obedience, I'll give you a time. But if not, I'll just send you the pasture. I can't use disobedient horses. I can't have the chariot with a horse going one way, the other horse going the other way. I don't want to stop you. I'm going to keep on going. I want to take this road to the left. I don't want to go over here. I don't want to go over there. That's no good. And so those horses, even though they were a good breed, even though they had good parents or grandparents, there's something in there. Some gene that came from some lost wild stallion, perhaps, who knows. But there's something inside just doesn't want to surrender. Yes, he wants the food, he likes the castle, he likes the protection, he likes to be close, he likes everything, but not too close. I want the master to touch me, but, but not too much. I want to do what I want to do. So now they just watched from behind their fence. As the other horses got brushed and anointed and healed and ate the beautiful oats and molasses but he saw that beside those fenced in rebellious horses there were some colts on their side colts would they be rebellious who knows but the very fact there were cults meant there was hope for the future. It wouldn't be a shame for the great chariot stud, his blood that ran through their veins. Who knows? Maybe. Maybe there would be hope for that fourth generation. Maybe that little colt wouldn't have those itchings Disobedience is rebellions, thinking I know what I have to do. I know what road I should take. I don't like this. I don't like that. I, who knows? There might be hope for the cults. I pray that God save the cults. That God save the cults. So we do well to ask each one of us who holds the reins of our life. Who's in control? Whom do we fear? Whom do we obey? Whom do we follow? 
Whom do we love? Who is our provider? Who is our protector? Who controls our ways and our paths? And who controls our destination? The answer to these questions will be the life that you will have. To be the bearer of the chariots that take the king's son from place to place or be left to live the rest of your life with nothing to say of your inheritance. That's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. To have so much inheritance and perhaps only to pass it on just because I don't want to obey. Just because I don't want to surrender. I don't want to lift that halter because I know that halter means I'll have to do what he wants. But look at the horses that take the carriage. Look how happy they are. Look how they prance proudly as they take the king from city to city. Look how proud they feel to have been chosen to be bearers, to be used to take the king where he wants to be. What will be your life? Whether it be that of a wild stallion that refuses to be caught, that roams the field without a purpose for his existence, just waiting, waiting for the butchers to find him and make some sausage somewhere in Italy or Argentina. Yes, that's what makes a sausage taste different. Is that the purpose? To run until the devil grabs you and says, okay, you're not his, you don't want to be, and I think he's left you for your own. Strong but useless. Is that what you want to be? Rich but useless without a purpose in life? To be the richest man in, in the cemetery? Is that your goal? Things you will never know. You will never see. Places to see the king do what he does. You'll never see if you remain wild. So what can you do? Nothing really. It's not your decision to be caught but if he approaches you, it is your decision to want to stay. If the master approaches you, it's a privilege to be called. Jesus said in Matthew twenty-two fourteen, for many are called, but few are chosen. And why did he say that? It was a feast. Yes, the people wanted to come to the feast. They were called to the feast. Oh, we like it, the food. Yeah, I like this food. I'll eat up all and drink up all the champagne. But there was something. They refused to stop at the door. They refused a protocol. And the protocol of the feast of the kings was, you must let me wash your dirty feet. You must let me, let me put on clothes and take off your dirty clothes. But there were some. I don't want to be washed. I don't want to repent. I don't want to change my dirty, broken clothes. I just want to go sit down dirty like I am. Give me food. Give me what I need, what I want. So Jesus said, the king will say, hey, you. Hey, you. Oh, but they called me to come. I got my invitation. Get out. And then it's when Jesus said, many are called, but few are allowed to stay. Few are chosen. And that process of training is what we call breaking the horse. 
It's not the right thing, but eventually the horse inside, he surrenders, he breaks, his will gives in, and he's willing to be used by God. So, what is God's horse? God's horse to pull his chariot only, or for him to ride? We read in Matthew 21 how Jesus came riding on a donkey. Because that was the peace horse. If a king rode into a city on his war horse, it was the conqueror. If the king rode into a city on a donkey, it was the peace king. The people said, you don't have to conquer us. We surrender. And the city opened up and he came in that's why Jesus, to those that were crying, Hosanna, blessed be the king that comes. We accept you. We believe in you. He came riding upon the colt of an ass, the peace donkey. And what is? God is a God of horses. In Psalms 18, 10, it says, he rides upon a, cher a cherub. He speeds upon the wings of the wind. Isaiah 19, 1 says, Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud. In Psalm 68, 17, he says, The chariots of God are thousands. But you know, in the Bible, the horse is always referred to in connection to war. Even in Revelation, 19 verse 11 it says I saw the heavens open and behold a white horse and he that sat on him was called faithful and truth and righteousness and he does judge and make war. The horses in the scriptures are vehicles of war of conquering and I want to end in Job Chapter 39, the description of God's perfect horse, God's war horse. Listen to this, Job 39, 19. Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you make him? Afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. A war horse, as he opens his nostrils, as he runs towards war, his sight to be seen. I've seen paintings of that. The nostrils as huge holes extended to get all that oxygen inside to run towards the battle. The glory of his nostrils, the glory of running towards war, towards the enemy, against the enemy. Verse 21, he paws the ground in the valley and rejoices in his strength and he runs out to meet the armed men. Wow, that's God's horses. Not, oh, I don't know, uh, I'm afraid. That, that guy looks like he got a devil. Oh my, no, no, no. It says he runs out to meet, meet the army and get out of here. Get out of my way now. Wow, that's God's war horse. That's his pride. That's the end of his training. The horse almost knows what to do. He runs towards the battle. He doesn't pause unless he feels a tug of the rein saying, not now, hold on. He knows. The master knows best. So all that energy is still inside, but you wouldn't know because he's still inside. Inside the raging to run when he must. And the king says, now. But inside he's still. And you would think 
He's just an old plodding horse dressed up like a war horse. He seems so meek. He seems so innocent. So little danger, this horse. Look, he doesn't even move. He doesn't even quiver. He knows how to be still because the master is not moving. He knows how to wait. The battle rages. The master says, wait. The men shout. He's not moved. He's not tempted because the war is not his. He knows. The war is the warrior that he carries into battle. And he sits still and he waits. And he waits. And he waits. Till he feels a shift. He feels a little pressure on his side. Get ready. He knows what that means. He gets ready. And then go and out he runs straight into the midst of the battle to the surprise of the enemies and scatters his enemies. Whew. Verse 22. He mocks at fear. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Yes, I've been in many situations with huge armies in front when I feared. I wasn't quite, quite the war horse I should have been or even should be because it says he mocks at fear. His biggest enemy, remember, the biggest enemy of the horse is fears. Remember? That's the biggest thing he must conquer. But he's been trained. He's been obedient. He's learned to reign in his fears because he trusts the master. What shall I fear? Until he's so sure that the king is with him. That there's nothing for me to fear that he mocks fear. He mocks himself. He mocks his own weaknesses. He says, for God is with me. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? He mocks fear, verse 22, and is not frightened. Neither does he turn his back from the sword. He goes straight in, for he knows the one that's behind him has a sword and will take care of that sword that's lifted against him. Yes, he does not fear, neither does he run from the battle. Oh, he doesn't turn back from the sword. Verse 24. <laughs> Look how he runs into battle. He swallows the ground with fearness and rage. No, he doesn't sneak up. No, no, no. He swallows the ground. <laughs> In expectation of yet another victory. For when he, see, when he sees war, when he sees enemies, he sees victory. Verse 23, the quiver rattles against him. Yes, he can feel, he can feel, he's not defenseless. He feels, he feels the quiver. He knows there's arrows there. He knows the bowman is on top. He doesn't fear. Now if he didn't, if he thought he was, he was without weapons, then he might have a reason. But it says he can see the glittering of the spear. The sun shines and the spark says, ha, ah, there's a spear still there. And he can feel the shield is still there. So he runs. 
He swallows the ground with fearness and rage. Neither does he believe that it is the sound of the trumpet. For he said among the trumpets, Ha ha! Trumpets are the sounds of the battle. The sounds the enemy says to make us fear. The words he throws. The sounds he throws at us to make us stop. To make us fear. To make us draw back from the battle. He says, ha ha! Because he smells the battle afar off. He hears the thunders of captains and the shoutings of his army. For he knows that with him rides Jehovah Shabbath, the Lord of hosts. He knows that although he doesn't see anything, he knows behind him there's hosts of angels. He can feel the king on him. He knows he is not without a rider. He is not without direction. And he runs straight towards battle until, unless the king at the last, mo last moment says, okay, this time, don't do what you think. You have to do run right through. Turn. And he feels the shifting. And he stops in his tracks doesn't question and he turns and goes around to the back and then stops at the order of the king and waits till the order comes no the horse even though he's been in a thousand battles he will not go to battle because what he did in the last battle. Because the battles change. The strategies change. The times change. The enemies change. So what does he do? He does not know. He runs when he must. He stops when he must. He turns when he must. Whatever the master says. And if the master says, turn. Let's go back. He doesn't question. But I'm ready for battle. I went all the way here to battle. He says, no, go back. Go back. This is not your battle. But I, 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 I live to battle. No, nope, that's not your battle. Like Paul, when he was followed by this little witch, day after day, no, don't go into battle. I'll tell you when. I'll tell you when. Go back. Keep on going. Yeah, yeah, but I got the power. No, you don't. I'm the power. And if I'm not with you, you have nothing. You're just a horse. A horse is a horse, of course, of course. Even though it's a talking horse. That's all we are. Nothing more. We're nothing. But because of him, he makes us to be horses of war. Ah, what a privilege to be called to the stables of the prince. Never Never in my life could I have seen or felt or tasted of what I have if I had insisted on going on my rebellious ways. But I said, I surrender. Teach me. Teach me not to fear. Teach me not to judge. Teach me not to get mad. Teach me not to do things on my own. Teach me to surrender. 
teach me to become a father of many cults, the grandfather of many war horses. And when I can battle no more, just allow me to stay in your stables, close to your home. And in that day I will dwell in the house of he who loved me till the end of time. Father, I pray for the colts. Such inheritance flows in their veins. Father, 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 Allow us to be faithful parents, grandparents. Allow us to show in our lives the surrender that you want of them. Forgive, O oh Lord, the rebellions, the disobediences. Uh, call again, O oh Lord. Let them not be put to pasture who carry such wonderful inheritance in their veins. I pray for the love of those whose inheritance they carry. Those that were faithful to the end for their sake and for your children's sake, I pray, have mercy. Forgive the sins of the rebellious mares, the rebellious stallions, who choose their ways and their thoughts and their ideas instead of surrendering that you might do what you want and how you want it. Break them with your love. Break them with your patience, oh, whisperer of souls. Conquer them, I pray. Those that listen today to these words, let the wild stallion turn his ways before he becomes another casualty of sin. Another casualty of the hater of mankind and the enemy of the king. And Father, I pray for the colts that in, in their blood carry a quarter inheritance or a half inheritance or a hundred percent blood of champions. Whisper, whisper them home, allure them to their destiny, cause them not to be horses without understanding, but cause them to understand that your banner over them is not a rope that your banner over them is love. And with, with love you will teach them, or with love you will let them go if they want to go. For you will not stop man. You let him be free. Even if he goes to his destruction, even if he wastes years of his life, Have mercy, Lord, on those horses that have developed bad habits. Have mercy, O oh Lord, on those horses that don't understand 
They don't act like your horses. They act like their own wild natures. Forgive them, Lord, please, in this time, in this special time. Forgive the parents that have allowed their cart, colts to run without being stopped or hindered. Forgive them, O oh Lord, for not wanting to give their colts over to you. And Lord, have mercy. Once again, I ask upon your servants and upon your friends that gave them that inheritance. The inheritance not of servants, but of friends. Keep teaching me, Lord. Keep teaching me. I don't want to ever stop learning. I don't want to ever think I know when I know nothing. You are so great that everything I've learned of the past is nothing compared to what I have to learn of your ways. Teach me. Teach me. I want to be teachable. No matter, no matter if I can't run, I know that you'd rather an obedient slow runner than a disobedient racehorse. So Lord, here I am. I'll do my best. Maybe I can't run yet as I could before, but I can walk into battle. I'm not afraid if you're with me. Teach me. Use me till I can walk no more. I love you, Lord. I love you, Master. I do not follow you for fear, but because I love you and I trust you because you first loved me and washed the dirt and anointed my coat with oil and cause my face to shine as did Moses. Lord, gather the colts into your house, I pray, and teach them to surrender and to obey. Ah! Uh -huh.